social bubble where you're seated? Yeah? Go ahead and have a seat. Wow, this is good, eh? So we had about uh, 140 people registered, and we're really excited. Uh, the overflow is completely shut down. No one's suffering up there today. So we're super happy to finally be uh, joining the two sanctuaries together and uh, experiencing this together. So it's great. Uh, I'd like to let everyone know that Pastor Joel and Rhonda are away today. They're in Watson Lake. Um, Watson Lake hasn't had a pastor for uh, a number of months now, uh, and they've been reaching out and saying, can someone please come and, uh, and speak here and do some worship? And so Joel and Rhonda felt sorry for them and left. Uh, so we'll bless them well, uh, in what they're doing there, and uh, we'll pray that they have a wonderful time with the Lord in Watson Lake. Um, do we have any new members in the building? We're, we're uh, expecting to celebrate a young, a really young girl. Her name is Wynne Hawks. I don't know if she's here yet. Doesn't look like it. Uh, so Anthony and Ashley Hawks have had a baby and her name is Wynne and she looks super cute in pictures. They had to socially distance for a little while. So. <laughs> Just um, yeah, so if you see them here today, oh, they are actually uh, in the lobby. I saw them through the door. So congratulations to Anthony and Ashley on the birth of their long-awaited baby. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, and if you are visiting and new, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Um, I want to mentioned something uh, uh, slightly hesitantly because um, it kind of depends on on what you what you feel uh, but I've read the the, uh, the latest guidelines on on masks for churches for uh, faith s services and you go you scroll down to the part that says singing and you you click on that link and it takes you to a place for live music and it says that when you sing, you don't have to wear a mask. But it, it, it seems like when you sit, you have to wear one, so it's really weird. Uh, and when you go anyway, to the bathroom. and when you go to the bathroom, you have to wear a mask, <laughs> which isn't always the worst. Anyway, um, 
That is what the guidelines currently say. I don't know if that's what they mean to say, but if you're comfortable singing without a mask, that's what the guidelines say presently. Um, lastly, uh, there is a women's retreat next weekend. This weekend, yes. It's going to be at Camp Yukon. I believe there are some spaces left. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be warm and sunny, and there's going to be a great time with the Lord out there. So, Karina's excited, and you can go with her. Sunny, oh, yes. Yeah, women's retreat is always an amazing time um, of ministry and time with the Lord and escaping from your children if you have them. Um, lastly, I would just like to say something about, about giving. And uh, this is my second week in a row where I, I, I'm not using a, a verse, but I want to use an example from the people who make up our church. So we just completed our work bee. We have a work bee every May long. And so we had that last weekend. And a bunch of people donated a bunch of money. And this money is used directly for uh, fuel, for cleaning supplies, for uh, building material, for all kinds of things like this, for feeding the, the workers. And I just want to make the point that the way I see it, that money is directly translated into ministry. It's directly translated into eventually people hearing the gospel. It's not a direct thing, but it, it does have the impact of a direct, uh, basically, <laughs> paying for people to hear the gospel in a way. So um, a lot of what we do here at Bethany is just people giving towards the work and ministry and the kingdom of God and it's a beautiful thing to see in action. It was so great to be out there together. We have a whole bunch of photos on, on Facebook. Uh, there's an album of work bee photos if you want to see some of the things that have been done out there. Uh, so you can check those out. Um, but if you'd like to give, there's many ways. We do have an offering plate in the back or you can give online in many different ways uh, from our website to the Church Center app. So. That's it for announcements. We're going to get back into worship, so why don't we all stand together and enjoy worshiping with like 140 people. Amen? Amen. All right. How many believe that God never changes? And that's a good thing for us because... His unchanging character means that he is faithful through every circumstance, through every trial, through every situation, through every pain and joy and celebration. Definition says the immutability of God is the attribute of God never changing. His will, his character, or his covenantal promises with us. Isn't that awesome? Westminster Dictionary says God is spirit who in his very being and wisdom and power and holiness and justice and goodness and truth is unchanging and always eternal. It says in Hebrews 13, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. Revelations 1.8, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Lord who is, who was, and who is to come. The Almighty, Eternal One. Aren't you grateful you serve an eternal God who came down to this earth to save us and to take all of our sh shame and our sin and our pain and give us joy in exchange. Let's sing this song, My God is Still the Same. Just as the way still at the mention of your name. They'll say my God is still the same. And as the walls, they still fall at the mighty sound of praise. They'll say my God is still the same. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail?
thank you, Jesus, that we are here worshiping you together in one voice. We lift up our eyes to you, Lord Jesus. You are where our help comes from. Your help comes from only you. Our help comes only from you, maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. You promised your people in Joel chapter 2 that you would give them the first rains and the latter rains, Lord Jesus, that you would give them back the years that the locusts have eaten. Hallelujah, Lord. As they came to you in repentance, Lord, you would pour out your reward, your blessing on them. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. We look to you for a new thing, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, that you promised in Isaiah. Let's sing of his nature this morning.
lift up out into the promised land. We stir up our faith, Lord. You are called. believing God for, just put it in your hands and just raise it to the heavens. Give it to the God who is faithful, who has overcome every obstacle and every circumstance, every wasteland and every barren woman who gives life to death, who overcomes every shame and every sin and every pain. Lift it up to God this morning. God, you are faithful and able to take these requests we have. We give them to you, God. Our anxiety and our fear and our doubt, we believe in faith and we lift it up to you this morning. that perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment and some of us here are fearing punishment from God and we are full of condemnation this morning and he is here to say I am gentle and humble in heart by choice he is and he comes to us and he wants to give us every good gift right every good gift love pour it out, Father of light. Every good gift comes from you, Father of light. Oh. We receive from you. Just reach out your hands, church. Receive everything you can have from the Lord. All of it. Like a little child, ask for everything they can have.
Church, you guys sing it out all my life. Pray you be with us in these moments as we look into your word, speak to our hearts by your spirit, illuminate what you want us to hear and know about you and your plans for us and the lives you want us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. God is good. This morning, amen. Has anyone had uh, God at work in their lives recently? Anybody? God moving in your life, yeah? Uh, any situations that he's intervened in that you needed him to? Anyone had that happen? Yeah? You can just do a show of hands. Or you can, or you can stand up and give a testimony. Um, any mountains moved over this? You know, maybe this time of COVID, anyone had a, a mountain move? Oh, you want me to put this higher? I feel like it can't get any higher. I'm allergic to microphones. Um, if this doesn't work, we have backups, right? How about anyone have any doors open that they've been praying for by God? Anybody through this time of COVID or recently? How about any healings? Has anyone had a healing recently? No? Yeah? Well, I think God has been moving. He's always working. And one of my favorite things is that he brings us along. We get to co-work with him uh, in what he is doing. And he, I just love that he gives us the opportunity to share in his joy and if, you, if you've prayed for someone and seen them 
healed or seen a mountain moved in their life, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? If you don't know, then you, you've got to get going. I'm telling you. It can seem, seem daunting trying to jump into God's work, especially if you're a new believer, but he, he seems to want this. Um, it can seem like maybe something that happened a long time ago. It's, a, it's just an ancient thing that doesn't happen anymore. Does God really move today? Or it can seem like maybe it's too late. You've made too many mistakes or you're not 20 anymore and you, you, you can't take the risk or, or just the fact that it is risky. You've got a, a reputation to keep up. You don't want to look like a strange person, maybe. But I, this morning I want to kind of, I want to look at some of the heroes of our faith and maybe let go of some of these fears and exchange them for faith. And we, we just may see, we may see some great things. We may see a Jackie Pullinger arise. I don't know if you know who she is. She was a, she was a 21-year-old woman um, back at like, I think in the 50s or 60s or something. She went into the, the walled city of China uh, where it was, it was basically a cage for drug addicts, drug dealers, brothels. And she went in there to share the gospel. And it's, her story is amazing. You can read it in a book called Chasing the Dragon. And you will hear about people coming off of opiates in, in, in an instant. And what we know about the mind nowadays is we know that there are actual pathways that get created in our brains when we're addicted to things. And that's a physical miracle when, that, when God healed those people instantly. They had zero withdrawals. It's unbelievable. Not every case, obviously, but she has many, many cases where she would pray for people and uh, just amazing. Or maybe uh, this is one of Natasha's favorites is uh, Gladys Aylward. Maybe a bit of faith and you could see something like this. She was in China as a missionary during uh, the Sino-Japanese War, the second one. And this is about 1937 to 45. Uh, she was a missionary. She had an orphanage going and the Japanese were invading and she marched these children over mountains uh, being shot at. She was actually wounded uh, as she did this, but she saved around 100 children at this time. It's just amazing what a little bit of faith can do. Well, I was looking at uh, the life of a guy with a great last name, Smith Wigglesworth. He was around 1859 to 1947, and he had an amazing healing ministry. And this is just, just reading the Bible and a little bit of faith. This man was a plumber. That's, if you look at his Wikipedia, that's what it's listed as, his, his uh, job. But he traveled the world with a great healing ministry, he, like every type of healing, cancer, blindness, uh, uh, stomach maladies, everything. It's kind of interesting that one of his uh, techniques seemed to be hitting the devil where the ailment was, so he would actually punch people. <laughs> and uh, He's saying he's not punching them, he's punching the, the demon that's affecting them. But hey, it's all, it's all written down and recorded as a, as a healing work that actually happened. So. It's amazing. I want to look at a life that's maybe a little bit more relatable. Uh, this morning, I want to look at uh, John the Baptist. Very relatable person, yeah? Yes. Some of you who, who know <laughs> think that's funny. <laughs> so we don't know a ton about his life, but we do know he had a miraculous birth, and by the time he was 30, he was a, a, just a wild man uh, living out in the desert. And... Um, he had a, a job of calling people to repentance and finding the Messiah. So I'd just like to refresh on John the Baptist for a little bit and go over his story a little bit this morning. Uh, so we'll start in Luke chapter 1, and this is verse uh, 5 to 15. So this is... Uh, in the just before Jesus, this time. Uh, Zechariah of the division of Abijah, he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. 
Now, while Zechariah was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn, oh, and it goes on to 16 here, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and, they, and he will go before him in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people of the Lord. So it's going to be hard to be like John the Baptist. He has a, a miraculous birth, a uh, birth uh, that has, comes with a job uh, with it. So it's not exactly relatable to us. Um, but the most important thing to see is that he has come to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is a, a prophecy that is found in Malachi and in Isaiah, uh, where God is promising this, that Messiah will come, but he wants to send a forerunner. And this is the idea that I want to uh, basically impart this morning, is that we're all called. Uh, we're called to be a kingdom of priests. We're all called to be forerunners uh, to Christ, in a sense. We don't have John's job, obviously, but everywhere you go, your witness is forerunning. It's supposed to make a path for people to find and know Christ. You can see um, another great moment in John's life, even before he's out of the womb. This is in uh, just a little bit further down in verse 42. Uh, Mary is pregnant with Jesus. And she comes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth. And it says that uh, Mary, uh, Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it that is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to me, my ears, the baby in my womb, leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. That's a takes one to no one kind of situation there. A little bit further on, when John is, uh, this is basically the end of what we know of John's early life, and then it skips right to uh, the work he began doing. And I'd like to look at that from Matthew's gospel. This is found in Matthew chapter 3, mostly because it's a little bit more brief than what Luke writes about it. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. If you wonder what locusts are, you just look at a grasshopper. They're the same thing. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And then briefly, Jesus came uh, from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. 
John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you do, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to, for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from, the hev- from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So there's a lot in there. Uh, this is basically the main bit of John's life. We see a little bit later on that he is imprisoned because he's a bit of a loud mouth about God's law. Uh, the, way, the way we should live. He confronts uh, one of the Jewish uh, leaders who's been appointed by, by Rome and uh, this guy has taken his brother's wife and it's horrible and so John confronts him and is arrested and finally uh, beheaded uh, a little bit later on in Jesus' ministry. So John is... Shut the other one off and turn this one on. So we had just read half the Bible, and we're looking at John the Baptist's whole life um, and wondering where we all fit in, right? Well, he's a great prophet. He's taken to be a great hero. Can I just read you one last thing about him, what Jesus says? Jesus says, Behold... Those who, uh, this is in Matthew chapter 11, if you're following along, uh, starting in verse 9. What then did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. That's John the Baptist. He's a very strange man. He has a very specific mandate, and then God's basically like, okay, you can come to heaven now. Um, and he has a, a specific task to, to do before then. And he may not seem like the most uh, readily relatable character to us, but like I was saying, there is something in his ministry that I believe God is calling us all to. I think God is calling us all to be a little bit more weird than we have been. A little bit more salty, maybe, than we have been. This is a guy, he, he would have been considered pretty salty, hey? When the Pharisees showed up at his baptisms, and he starts yelling at them. And definitely a bit odd. He's been living out in the desert. We don't know how long he lived in the desert. Did his parents just send him out there as, a, as a, like a toddler? Or was that a, like, when, when did that happen? We have questions. Um, so, thankfully, I don't think God is calling us to that f- sort of uh, a lifestyle. God is not calling us to run off into the wilderness. That job has been completed. It's been fulfilled. There's no need to worry. But he is calling us all to the same type of a task. Maybe a smaller version of it. To prepare people to see Jesus. To prepare them to see Jesus as Lord, to reveal Christ. He's preparing us all to do this, I believe. Now, this isn't always a safe thing for us to do either, and so it's a little bit frightening. We know what happened to John the Baptist for his actions. He did enjoy a time of ministry, but then he was uh, arrested at 
probably around the same age as Jesus died in, in his early 30s and beheaded for his beliefs. But as Christians, we all have the same call to go and to make disciples. This is the Great Commission. And to go without fear, without being afraid, without being partial to whom we're going to share, to whom we're going to speak, uh, and without being freaked out that we have to be a little bit different. I think I th this is true for me, but we're, we could all use a little more of John's asceticism, hey? A little more of his, his uh, peculiar way. There's things that, because of who we know, because of who God is, because of the call he has on us, we have to do things a little bit differently than the rest of the people in this world. Um, and it's not necessarily a list of do's and don'ts, like, like you have to get up at this hour and read this amount of scripture to qualify, or you have to not watch this or that, or attend these kind of parties, or have this ideology. Um, this is all supposed to come out of the relationship we have with, with Jesus. We know him, and it affects our lives. We know him, so we, uh, the outflow of that relationship is we want to spend time getting to know him deeper. We want to be prepared to share uh, our testimony at any time. We want to be ready and, and willing and able to do anything God calls us to. And so sometimes that means we don't get to live like everyone else is. And we're not supposed to be surprised about this. Uh, depending on which translation you read, sometimes we're even called aliens on, uh, in this land. Um, second, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 11 and 12, it says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners or travelers and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, uh, most of whom would be non-believers, as Peter's writing, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So our life is supposed to bear witness to Christ. That's what Peter's calling us to. The, the way we act, the things we say, it's all supposed to bear witness to the goodness of God, um, his lordship on earth, uh, and and reveal something of his love and, and essentially do what John the Baptist did. It's to forerun. It's to call people to something higher and greater than they already have if they're not already saved or living for Christ. So, it is, it, I, I do find it, uh, for a lot of people, for myself included, it, it can be kind of a, a scary idea to tell your friends and family, maybe your coworkers, that there's another way. There's another way than what you're living right now. You may need to change some things. You may need to repent. The word which means change. Turn, turn from and change to something else. But if you can see past that, if you can see past how that might go over, how it might be awkward, how they might not like you after, if you can see past that to the effect of it, then it all becomes worth it. I think it's the most worthwhile thing on earth, actually, is to be part of God's work in changing someone, helping them come to a place of repentance and then to a place of freedom. We're, we're in this right now with a freedom session. There's a course happening here at the church. We have um, about 50 people right now running through a, this program called Freedom Session, and it's designed to do just what the name says it's designed to bring freedom to your life, and we're at a stage right now that is covering repentance. Uh, we're actually we've we've actually done 18 weeks of this course. Where we've got two more to go, and it's really exciting to see what God is doing in some people's lives. Um, but you see, repentance is a is a painful thing. It, it might even mean you have to make amends in some cases. That's that's what we were looking at uh, last week, actually is making amends for some of the things that we've done wrong to people. We saw Matthew, the tax collector, he was really into making amends. He promised to pay back four times what he owed anybody. 
which uh, mathematically that seems difficult to do, but he must have known what he was doing. Um, <laughs> but it, it might mean writing a letter to someone we've wronged in the past. It might mean paying somebody back for something we took and then some. Or it might mean apologizing for something that we don't feel that sorry about. All these kinds of things. Repentance is a hard thing. Um, changing is hard. Changing uh, lifestyles, changing habits. These things are all hard and difficult, and they, they basically involve a form of sacrifice and pain. But on the other end of it is freedom. John the Baptist foreruns. He prepares the way for Jesus. We don't get Jesus without John the Baptist. Nobody gets Jesus without John the Baptist. So for us, that might mean hard talks with people. For us, that might mean showing a new way to people. For us, that might mean being a little bit like John the Baptist for our friends, family, and coworkers to see. There'll be no effect if we don't have our own affect, right? Now, as painful as, this, as it can be at the start, there's always a reward with God. He rewards faith. He rewards faithfulness. He rewards actions. And, he does, and this is his joy. This is something he does. In Daniel chapter 12, uh, verse 3, he, uh, Daniel is actually prophesying regarding the end times. So it's possibly talking about what we're living in right now. And in verse 3 it says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. How'd you like that? To shine like a star forever and ever. God often talks about heavenly reward, you know. In the Beatitude, uh, where he says that, you know, people may despise you, they may spitefully use you, they may mock you, they may mistreat you for, for Jesus' name's sake. Uh, it says in Matthew 5.11, great is, the, is your reward when that happens in heaven. So God is always talking about this. Um, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus ends a parable in the same way. Uh, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So John the Baptist has this job of forerunning for Christ, and we see him baptizing in the, in the river Jordan, and the whole area is coming to him. All these people are coming to him. They're hearing his message of repentance. They're asking him what they should do, and he is turning them towards righteousness. He's turning them towards the the path that is straight and narrow. And this is what I'm saying that God is calling us to do in the lives of all those around us, whether it's our own children or friends and family and coworkers. But not only is it part of our task as Christians, there's great reward for it. There's an eternal reward. It's a very exciting idea, um, but it's sometimes it's hard to hold. And I kind of liken it to... Uh, cathedrals that were built over hundreds of years. There's one actually being built right now. Uh, I haven't been to it. My, my brother went and took all these amazing photos and showed me uh, the Basilica Familia in Spain. And it was started in 1882. And it will be done in five years. So it's a 144-year plan. The original architect is not going to see the effect, is he? He's never going to step foot in that building. That was the way a lot of these most amazing uh, buildings and structures on earth have been built, is with a, a future look, looking past your own life even into what, what will be, what can be. And it's the same thing when we're planting our, our Christian seeds, when we're trying to, to affect someone for Jesus. We may not get to see it. And we may not see the reward for what we've done on this side. But there is a future where God will complete the work. God will bring that, that plant to, to the point of harvest, so it's ripe, as uh, many of the analogies go in the Bible. 
It's a beautiful image, I think. God is a great rewarder. There's much talk of mansions and all kinds of things in the future in heaven. Um, but I believe there's also an immediate reward for many of our actions as Christians. And the thing I see the most is, um, is it's what Jesus ends a lot of his parables with when he talks about masters and stewards. When he says, uh, the master is pleased with the work of the steward. They have done a good job. The master says, come share in the joy of your master. And when we pray for people and see them healed, see them saved, see them set free, any of these things, that's what happens immediately. If you've ever done it, you, you know that you immediately, it's, it's tears of joy, it's, um, it's fist pumping, it's, it's uh, life-changing stuff. It is the most beautiful thing that I know, and many of you probably know. You see someone get healed, it's a celebration. That's an immediate reward. You're sharing in the joy of the master. Uh, God says, or Jesus says, uh, that it's, if one person repents, all of heaven is rejoicing. And you feel the same way when you're involved, when you're co-working with Christ, when you're praying along uh, with the will and purpose of God. And not only do you feel like God's purpose is being fulfilled, but you have a purpose. And so I want to encourage everyone this morning. We're being called personally to repent. Uh, many of us at the church on our freedom session, but in general, God is calling us to, to live unto him, to be part of, of leading many to righteousness, so being part of showing what it means to live a repentant life and an affected life, and to, in so doing, to lead many people to righteousness, and then you get to shine like the stars. Have you ever seen that on someone's face? Yeah. It's the most beautiful thing. So I want to leave you with that encouragement. Be like John the Baptist, um, except in a few ways. Uh, clothing, for instance, and residency, uh, if you can afford it. But be like John the Baptist. Um, don't be afraid of, of ruffling feathers. Don't be afraid of people getting upset with you. Uh, it's so important that people see what God can do in, the li in their lives. The other side of repentance is just freedom and joy and uh, eternal happiness. So that is my encouragement for this uh, first massive church service of 2021. I'm so excited. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna close with a song, right? Yeah. That's what we do here. So we're gonna do that, and it's gonna be great. So I invite everyone to stand, and we'll close in worship. Thank you, Jesus. We, this song is called Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Straight out of Scripture.
like to just pray for everyone before we leave. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for heroes of the faith that we can, uh, we can gain faith from. I pray for each one as they go out, that as they seek you and find you, that you would empower them uh, to, to live the life you're calling them to. Holy Spirit, speak to us this week, this day, uh, for our future, for the sake of our friends and family, those around us. We want to live unto you, and we want to fulfill the purposes you have for us. We want to walk in your plan and will, Jesus. Be with us. We need you, and we thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless everybody.